when they asked me to come speak to, uh, speak to you all, um, I w didn't know what to talk about. And they first told me to just tell my story. And I've told my story enough times that I'm a little bit bored with it. Um, so I wanted to try to do something a little bit more. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a, an abbreviated version of our story and how we got to where we are. And then I want to talk a little bit about how I feel um, we as processors and producers should work together to grow together. Um, so that's kind of the goal for today. And I'm going to meander around with this presentation and, and hopefully we'll get some good insights. And if you have any questions during the way or want to call me out on something that doesn't sound right or anything, please jump right in. Don't be afraid to um, ask me a question. So anyway, let's give this a try. All right, so 1968. Um, my family was on vacation. The, the family legend is my family was on vacation in Chicago uh, seeing relatives and the local realtor called and told my dad, Ed, the Bramber Brother Locker Plant is for sale. You got to come up and buy it. So uh, dad loaded us all back up and we uh, drove back to Minnesota and we bought the Bramer Brothers Locker Plant. You can see that one picture. It was a pretty beat up old building. Um, really in rough shape on the inside. Um, that's the picture of our family there right after uh, we got it opened up. The, I'm the adorable one in the corner, um, uh, looking around the corner. And uh, we grew up in a classic, uh, classic family business, uh, uh, a little local locker plant. You know, in 1970 when the food inspection law came through and we had a chance of being uh, custom exempt or uh, federally inspected, those were the choices in Minnesota. Um, Dad decided to be custom exempt because uh, he worked for farmers. He didn't need a USDA guy there. We did, we did service. We, we cut, cut meat up for farmers. So we stayed custom exempt and, and we did that um, from 1968 and then all the way up to 2000 when we built the new plant. So in 1997, Rob and I took over um, from mom and dad and um, we didn't have the next generation of heir apparent. He had um, two young uh, daughters that didn't seem to be very interested in the business and I had no kids and was strongly considering uh, not having kids. And um, so we didn't have that next generation so we knew we had to build a business um, that could be sold. So as we looked at our business, we, we had retail, we had processing and we had um, um, a deli and we did catering on the weekends and you know as a small locker plant the only reason you go into the catering business is working seven days a week isn't good enough you want to put weekend nights in you know so <laughs> so we did all those things to try to make ends meet and Rob and I are thinking that this is a you know this is a difficult model to ultimately make as a saleable business so we want to do something that we can um, so we can generate a business that we could sell someday. So uh, we argued a little bit about it. I thought I was a retail. I was the retail deli guy, so I thought we should focus on retail and deli. And Rob was a processing guy. He did all the slaughter. He did all the sausage making. Um, you know, to keep in perspective, and it, literally up until like 1998, I think it was, he killed two days a week. He killed every animal our company killed and then he made sausage the other three days and he made all the sausage we made. And I ran the retail stuff and did the books and stuff. So, um, so anyway, we're going back and forth and Rob just wanted to be processing. So as I looked at our list of processing customers, like so many other businesses, the top 10 farmers did 50% of our processing business. And these guys are doing direct marketing and they didn't even know it was called direct marketing then. I mean, nobody had talked about direct marketing in the early 90s. And, and um, so we decided that if we're going to grow our processing business, those were the people we had to help because we saw all the auction bills come up and it was one farm after another going, going out of business in the 80s and in the early 90s. And we knew our market was diminishing for processing because there was less and less farmers. But when we looked at our list, we could see that these farmers were selling to more and more people. So then we had the idea of what can we do to support those people? So we created a program called the Market Maker Program. And the Market Maker Program was just a simple promise to our farmers. 
You do anything you can do to sell your meat direct to consumers and we'll do everything we can do to support you. That's, that's the deal. And, you know, it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of trying and a lot of no solid promises, but we all said we tried to work with each other. And um, we quickly realized this custom exempt status was in our way because everybody had to sell animals live and then we had to process for people and it got to be such a long lead time and it was totally inconvenient, like Blake said. It was just such a, such a challenge. So we knew we had to get USDA inspected. So we um, got our family and friends together and we generated $400,000 in capital from our family and friends. Um, we uh, leveraged a couple million dollars in debt and we um, went about to build a processing plant. And I, I should back up. So right before we actually did the private placement where we, were, we generated the equity, um, we had found an article in the local paper called the Fund for, uh, the little article for the Fund for Rural America was looking for proposals to decentralize livestock markets, to increase value added processing, and to, and to address HACCP. And that's exactly what we were doing. We were trying to decentralize um, livestock. Uh, processing and, and markets and you know from my limited vantage point now granted I just ran a little meat market in you know I in a deli and I didn't you know I'm not a beef guy I don't know beef markets but from my limited viewpoint in 1997 my farmers had basically one choice in regards to selling beef and that was what day they went to auction that was about it because back in the 90s there wasn't all these programs there weren't all these choices that producers could try to align themselves. It was just what day you went to auction. So um, we set about trying to do that. So we got a $400,000 grant from the USDA. And the Land O'Lakes administrated it. And we developed a 16-hour curriculum. We took the market maker program, which was a simple promise to farmers, and we turned it into a 16-hour curriculum called Branding Your Beliefs. And there's a couple things in Branding Your Beliefs we did right, but there's a bunch of stuff that we did wrong because we were naively optimistic. But anyway, we built this process, we got this money, we built this processing plant. So now we have a, at this point, we had a 10,000 10, square foot facility. The photo there is a business looking to partner with people to spread our dollars as far as we could spread them. So we developed this program called Branding Your Beliefs, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I just created a pyramid system, and I'm the top of the pyramid. So the more farmers I teach to do direct marketing, they got to come through Lawrence Meats to do the processing. So I'm enabling the sales force to help me grow my business. And as I is I realized that that makes the decisions for us to continue to partner with people um, so, so evident and so, uh, so important. So anyway, that's, um, we built the building in 2000. We proceeded to lose money like crazy because it was a, totally a field of dreams um, uh, project that we did. We build it and they'll come, right? And, and farmers can sell to anybody and everybody wants these products. And, and you know, the brutal realization of the American meat market is nobody is for want. Everybody says they may want local raised or they say they want grass fed, but they drive by three or four options to get their meat on their way home every day. And they may want grass fed or they may want local, but they're gonna pick up what's available and make supper because they're busy and it's exactly what Blake said. It, if it's not convenient and it's not right in front of them, they're gonna buy other stuff. So we talk about how people want these things but the reality is if it's not right in front of them, they won't get it. So we really struggled on getting enough market to support our processing plant and, um, and it, there were some real dark days in there. And, um, but anyway, we muscled through. We got enough volume and ultimately we got enough scale to the point where it got good enough that we were really starting to make money and our customers were demanding more and more and we had to build on. Well, we had just got our head out of the vice, you know, really um, from our dark days and now we needed to do a $5 million addition 
And Rob and I are like, we're tired, man. We're, we're like, we can finally take a full breath of air. You know, we're finally making enough money that we can, we're going to be okay. And now our problem is our facility is too small because our customers continue to grow. So we looked at the options, and if we would take more debt, it would be all on Rob and I to uh, figure out how to deal it. And, and our family and friends that were in, their liquidity was just that much farther away. The fact that I could tell my family when you could see your money and how much money you could see would get pushed back another 10 years. So we started looking for investors to help us out. And we actually found the perfect investor in that crop organic valley um, um, stepped up. And we actually, through their organic meat company, they bought out all of our other shareholders and kicked in a fair bit of money for us to build this next building. So organic valley is really critical in this whole conversation too because they're a very important strategic financial partner. And it took a lot of pressure off of Rob and I now that we can, we can uh, be more relaxed in, in thinking thoughts about growing forward and stuff uh, because we have a good financial partner. We have access to capital. We can continue to grow our business a, as we move forward. So around um, 2014, excuse me, around 2013, um, having just finished the addition at Lawrence Meats and things are going uh, pretty good in Minnesota, the state of Vermont invited us out um, myself and Arian Taboomery. Arian was a vice president at Lawrence Meats and a um, really bright guy. I think a bunch of you know him. Um, he was very involved in the niche meat group out of Iowa State. So um, the state of Vermont invited the two of us to come out and do an assessment of their meat infrastructure in Vermont. My two favorite stories from our trip to Vermont is uh, we stopped at a processor pl processing plant that got shut down. And it got sh shut down for inhumane treatment. And um, which is, I mean, they got like their grant pulled, not just shut down for the day, they just got, they got pulled. So talking to the owner of that plant, um, every sentence that he told Arian and I, he started with, I ain't gonna lie to you. I ain't gonna lie to you, but da 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 da. And I, I ain't gonna lie to you, but da 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 da. And we got done with the meeting, and I walked out to the car, and I told Aaron, I said, I ain't gonna lie to you, but if I start saying I ain't gonna lie to you, there's a pretty good chance I'm gonna lie to you, <laughs> just so you know. Because <laughs> before that, it didn't cross my mind to lie to you. So if it's, I'm thinking about it, you should be worried. So. So we left that meeting, we were chuckling along, and we were having a good time. Um, you know, it's always fun, just like you guys get to go from farm to farm. It's fun to see what other people do. Same thing for us going from meat processor to meat processor. The next place we went to was a farmer-owned processing plant. And that guy that we got to meet was just such a pleasure. And everything, every sentence that he started with, he says, well, you know, I'm just a poor, dumb farmer. It, and it, we got done with that meeting. And I, I got in the car and I said, I can assure you that he ain't dumb and he ain't poor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we ended up the, the, uh, the little tour. The last place we stopped on our tour in Vermont, we stopped at Black River Produce. And Black River Produce was a, um, a business that focuses on local vegetables and they expanded into cheeses and they really wanted to get into local meats and they were really frustrated with the infrastructure in the state. So they had just bought a Ben and Jerry plant, and um, they were going to put a meat processing room in there, and they were going to have these other plants in Vermont slaughter stuff for them, and then they were going to like add value and do the packaging and do the labeling and, and stuff. And and they asked us what we thought about that, and um, you know, Ari and I were just very candid with them, and we said, well you know, that you may be frustrated with these small processors because they're not putting it in the right box, they're not putting the right label on it, but from the, what we saw, that the issues may be more systemic than that, and if you put it in a cutting room just to address labeling and boxing, you're gonna find that the other issues are deeper. And what you really need is a competent, mid-sized slaughter facility to, um, to support what you guys wanna do. So they said, well, if we build it, will you run it? So we started a negotiation and we ended up that we did with Black River Produce, we 
we created Vermont Packing House. And Vermont Packing House is a business that's 50% owned by Lawrence Meats and 50% owned by Arian Taboomery. And Arian moved out there and he's the managing partner and he's running this facility. Well, you know, it's just a remarkably humbling uh, endeavor. You know, it's just the whole business thing for me has been a remarkably humbling endeavor, how we, we struggled with Lawrence Meats and now we're, we're starting again, we're starting anew. Um, <clears throat> and we're getting to see some of the uh, same challenges that we've seen in the past. The biggest revelation to me right now, one year into having Vermont Packing House is, you know, we, we, had, we had this idea that um, the thing that was lacking was the intellectual capacity to run a small, diverse plant. You know, I, I think that we all grossly underestimate when we work with small processors, the intellectual um, assets that are in that building to know how to deal with USDA, to know how to deal with the employees, and to know all the things that you need to know. Just like people underestimate the challenges of being a grass-fed beef farmer, you know, knowing all the things that you need to know, to know all the things you need to know about the processing plant. So what you find in meat processing, especially in, in, in mid-sized meat processing, is back around in the 80s, or maybe even a little bit before, any small plant that was in meat processing, any operator with half a brain specialized and did one thing really good because there was so much market. So we lost this talent of having a plant that killed and packaged and retail packaged and made sausage and did all the things that plants used to do because they got so focused on doing it fast and doing it cheap. So you had an, a nearly infinite market, so you could really specialize on one little niche. And, and so our assessment was we've lost that talent. So Lawrence Meats wants to try to build that talent, and Lawrence Meats wants to try to then um, build other plants in the country. So Vermont Packing House was our first attempt at it. And we're, we're one year in, and we're getting the crap beat out of us. You know, come to find out that Lawrence Meats we get the intellectual property, but the application of that intellectual property is still our supervisors, our leads, and our staff. And in Minnesota, we do things that we just can't quite do in Vermont yet because we don't have the staff trained up yet. And it's uh, very humbling on what a challenge it is, but very exciting because I know we're going to get there. So that's our story. So now, how did, we, how did we grow? How did we get up there? So it really boils down to producers and processors coming together. You know, I feel that everything we did is because we were challenged by excellent customers. You know, our customers um, put challenges to us and we, we, we rose up to the ones that we could address and we did the best we could to address them. And, and, um, and because of that, because of the challenge of those customers, we've grown into um, a reasonably good sized business with um, good capacities. So how do we do it? Well, it's really simply, it's so simple uh, to do this and it, it, it just boils down to the, the businesses to com that commit to one another grow together. It all gets down to commitment. You know, what are you able to do to commit? You know, um, and um, so that's as simple as it is, really. Is in every business model that you see that you've seen sustained growth, you've seen the partners within those businesses commit to one another. And um, so how do we do that? What does that really look like? Well, before, I, I should say, I had this thought of commitment. And um, uh, Lauren Gwynn worked with Arian Taboomery and w Richard uh, Stillman, and they uh, did a USDA paper in 2013. And their assessment of the case studies they did where they looked at Lawrence Meats, they looked at Will Harris, they looked at a couple other plants that did well and a couple plants that didn't do well. And their assessment on that is the plants that did well had commitments, had commitments from customers, had commitments from producers. Though that's what made it happen. So that's. That was my affirmation that I'm on the right track, that this, this focus of commitment is, is key to that overall growth. If you'd like to see that study, you can go to our webpage. It's lawrencemeats.com. 
and it's on our Niche Meets Marketplace page. So if anybody's interested in that, they can look at that study. It's very, very well done. So for us to decide who we commit to and what commitments we make, the first thing we need to know is um, who we are, where we are, and where we're going. So if you're, if you're a producer, if you're a grass-fed farmer, you know, I, I'm just thinking about there's kind of three basic broad groups that I think of in this group here. And that's the people that are pure producers that just want to grow animals. We have direct marketers. And then we have either the aggregators that are trying to run branded programs. Now, you might be in all three of these categories. You might be in one of these categories. But this is kind of the basic. Uh, is, is we're trying to grasp of who we are. This is kind of the basic um, uh, categories. So if you're a producer, you know, that just means you're, you just want to grow animals, you know, just want to uh, bang them out. And, um, and, you know, good news for you is it looks like the market is on fire for a while. And, um, um, you know, the no number 30% of the market was thrown out the, in five to eight years. And that number, just I've been, I've been thinking about that for the last couple of days. You know, there's 120,000 beef killed a day in the United States. You know, 30% of that market. You know, that's a, you're talking like 40 some thousand animals every single day. That's just like, that's a crazy, that's a thousand truckloads of cattle every day. Grass fed beef in eight years. Wow, we got a long ways to go. You know, that's a lot of beef. So if you're a producer, you're going to have options to sell those animals. And, and the, the, the thing that makes me the most sad about that is you don't need me. You know, I, I ain't in that. I can't do 40. I can do 40 head a day. You know, I need one one thousandth of that. So I'm out. You don't need me. You know, so so. The conundrum that I had as I was trying to pull this speech together is I got fixated on that idea that if you, got, if you all are just pr producers, um, for the last 15 or 20 years, our, our destinies have been interlinked, that you needed us small processors to service you to build this market. And you're on the cusp of breaking into the next level, and the reality is, is the producers don't need those small processors anymore. So the one thing that I will do, um, the, the, the one of the most important things that I wanted to say to you, if you are in this category of producer, you know, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget us all, little guys here, because the world is big and there's going to be a lot of beef sold, but don't starve us out of animals. And it's so easy to take the quick buck. Um, but it's so important to remember, you know, we've been asking consumers for the last 15 or 20 years, vote with your food dollar, right? We've been saying, your food dollar determines how meat is produced. Well, I'd like to say to you as producers, vote with your livestock. Sell your livestock to people that have your values and will, and will, uh, and will support the way you want to produce animals. Don't just sell to the first guy with the most money. So that, that's, my, that's, my wish to, that's my wish as I think about this presentation and one of the most important things that I wanted to say to, to this group. Now, if you're a direct marketer, it's really important that direct marketers, you know, that's 100 beef a year or less, and you need to sell direct to consumer. I, don't sell to restaurants. Um, don't sell to grocery stores. You know, it's not worth the hassle. You know, just find people that will buy direct from you and take the most money. And if you can't sell it direct, you're better off to just dump it to one of the other aggregators or one of the big programs. But to get into a program where you're trying to support restaurants and stuff, it's really not worth it. So I say sell bundles and portions. Because, and the reason I say don't sell to restaurants and stuff is the inventory is your biggest challenge. That at this point, Odds are you're not working with a processor that's sophisticated enough to tell you exactly what you receive from them. And odds are you don't have the inventory control in place that you know exactly what you sold. So that means inevitably you'll never know whether you're making money or not because you won't be able to track your costs because you won't know your inventory because 
there's such a wide disparity in values that you've assigned to cuts. So direct marketers, keep it small, keep it direct, go to consumers. And the one, one of the things that we got the most right about our Branding Your Beliefs program when we went out and we developed this curriculum is we told farmers, um, well, we originally told farmers, you can sell to anybody. You know, that's why we wanted to be USDA inspected is because we wanted to tell farmers, you can sell to anybody. You can go to farmers markets, you can sell to restaurants, you can sell to grocery stores. And we were so wrong about that because we didn't understand the impact of carcass utilization yet. We didn't understand the challenges associated with inventory. So we wasted a lot of farmers' money, and we wasted a lot of farmers' time, and we wasted a lot of our own time and money on this idealistic thought that we could do whatever we want. And so we've really reeled back, and in fact, um, um, I think some customers that do business with us are surprised on how often we say no. And often we say no to customers that come in and say they want to do this because we tried it and it don't work. So, you know, if you come to Lawrence Meats and try, want to do this, that, or the other thing, it's not unusual for us to say no, we won't do that. And it's, and it's because we've, we've watched really good people make really good, really good attempts at that and they didn't get there. So the, the, so the thing that we did the most right with Branding Your Beliefs is we said, brand your beliefs. Get people to buy the farm. You know, get people to buy into that relationship. It's like an NPR membership in the meets the coffee cup. You know, that, that's what you want people to feel like, because then they'll put up with that once a year delivery or the four month wait, because they're always part of your farm. If you're always giving them the newsletter, if you only need to sell a couple head, you need to really focus on that interaction is what you're selling and you're affirming the interaction with the transaction of meat. Um, but the money goes to the farm and building the farm and the infrastructure and you need to make the, the customer feel great about being involved in that. One of my favorite stories is I met with a lady once and she came in to show me her brochure and it was just so well done and she's gonna sell bundles of meat, and she went, through the, you know, she went through the curriculum later when I actually had some better ideas and I was more uh, focused, and she was, she was gonna do this whole deal, and, 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 and she, this was so well done, and we probably talked for 45 minutes about her marketing program, and I, we get through the whole conversation, I said, okay, how many head do you wanna sell? You know, how many head do you got? And she goes, well, I got two this year, and, <laughs> then I want to go from there. And it's just like, you know, really, I just spent 45 minutes talking to you about a marketing plan. You need to find eight people. You know, go find eight people to buy a quarter beef. You know, certainly you have eight friends that can do that. So, <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> that's me. I just sit around and talk. But anyway, the other, the other group is the agriculture aggregators and the branded programs. And that, to me, got to be a thousand beef or more. I mean, you know, Todd and I talked about, you know, oh, 40 head a week, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's a nice spot to be at, that's 2,000 head. Uh, even that's skinny. 20 beef a week is skinny. You know, you got to get your head. If you can't get past 1,000 beef a year, don't talk, to a don't talk to a restaurant. Don't talk to a grocery store. You know, now you don't have to raise all 1,000 head. You can aggregate them from other process or producers. But don't go into that market if you don't see that endpoint. And like every other business, I mean, when we started with Thousand Hills, Todd did one beef every other week, and it was cattle pack. And you know, we sold, and we took it to, you know, threw it in the back of a car and delivered it to a co-op. You know, you got to start someplace. So you're going to start small. But if you don't have your head around over a thousand, don't go into that market. So right now, some of the, the thoughts that I have about aggregators is, um, you know, the reality is, is in every regional market, there's so very few buyers. It's remarkable. And, and the majority of our guys, and the majority of our meat guys, and meat head, and they don't necessarily get what we're trying to do. So it, it's startling how few people control any regional geographic spot. You know, like in Minneapolis, there's probably, for grocery stores, there's probably like four or five guys. You know, those are the guys you need to know. And there's three or four distributors, and those are the guys you need to know. 
and you know there's a couple a couple women in there, but it's it's a male dominated, meathead dominated group. So you, you gotta you gotta be aggressive about getting to know those people. You need to make sure if you're an aggregator or brander that you've got a processor that can meet your customers' demands, and that's special certifications and all that other stuff. And then the one thing that's really recent in this group is you're going to be competing in a in a label claim environment that's increasingly confusing. You know, the, the whole what is really grass-fed and what is GMO free and you know there's there's what is local, you know, just there's a lot of label claims out there that are that are uh, hot buzzwords and it gets really difficult to try to find your way in this uh, complicated uh, complicated time. So who we are for processors. Now, processors to me fall into three categories. You got Billy Bob's processing, and, and Billy Bob, you know, he's just cutting meat, man. And, and it's his, it says it right on the door, you know, and this is what my dad did. It says Lawrence Meats because it was his, you know. It was, you know, Rob and I took over and we felt we needed a partner because we needed to uh, grow our business. But when dad did it, he bought it because it was his and he got to do it his way. So most of these Billy Bob processing, these little processing plants, it's got their name on it because it's theirs. Now, you as a direct marketer or an aggregator can't go into one of these small processors and be mad that they don't want to do it your way because it's their deal. You know, so you have to respect the fact that it has their name on the door and they want to do it their way. And you have a couple choices. You can either do it their way or you need to find a different processor. But you can't be mad that they don't want to do it your way. And then there's mid-sized processors like, um, like Lawrence Meats. And, and, and the challenge with a, a mid-sized processor like Lawrence Meats is most of the mid-sized processors got their thing and they do a fair bit of it. And, you know, they've got their own sales team and they're kind of doing their thing. So one of the challenges when you're dealing with a mid-sized processor is to make sure that they really want to do co-packing, they really want to work with you, or are they just doing it to fill a little empty time and the second they get something to fill that with their name on it, they're going to kick you out. So that's one of the challenges with mid-size. And of course, then there's the big guys. And you know, the, from mid-size to big, I mean, it's a big step. And the nice thing about the big guys is it's cheap. You know, it's really cheap. And, and um, if you can work with them um, and you can get to their terms, you can save some money. But they're not very flexible. And again, they're the same kind of deal where they have their own um, sales staff and stuff. And I was once told by a guy who was a friend of mine who had a um, meat processing plant that he grew to have a 100,000 square foot facility and a couple hundred employees, and uh, he lost it. And um, he lost it right around 9-11. And I was talking to him afterwards, and he said, you know, any time you do something in the meat industry and you get it to be interesting, they take it away from you. And, and, and it's, such a, it's such a scary thought to me as I continue to grow. But the big guys are so big and they're so capable that they'll watch you plow new ground for a long time. And then they may invite you in or they may just build a plant right next to you and starve your supply and take your customers and you're done like that guy did. So the big guys you have to be just cautious about where we are. You know, where we are can easily be put to physical, physical location, but it also can be where your position is in your growth curve. You know, like, uh, like when uh, we started with Todd, that they were one beef every other week. Well, that's where they were today, but that's not where they were going. So you, but you got to know where you are so you can see where you're going. And, and really, um, or where, really, where you're going is all about um, how big you're going to get. And the most important thing to me about determining how big you're going to get is success is self-defined. So the lady that I told you before that had two beef a year to sell, she had a successful direct marketing operation if she sold her two beef. And I am no one to judge that. That is her deal. That's what she wanted to do. She is successful. So there is no right and wrong answer. There is no, you decide what you say success is when it comes to direct marketing. 
when you get up to the aggregated and branded program, success is more easily defined for you because you're either broke or you're not. You know, so, so, um, so when you're deciding how big you want to get, there's a couple, uh, the, there's four critical things you want to think about. And, and first of all, it's supply. Um, you know, so um, I have a customer that does certified organic, 100% grass-fed Scottish Highlanders. And that's his claim. He is going to be supply limited. You know, he's never going to be huge because there's only so many certified organic, 100% grass Scottish Highlanders. And I think he has the majority of them. So he made a decision early on that limits his company's scope just by getting a specification that's so tight. So you have to decide what your supply is, you know, what claims you're going to put on it. You have to have the technical expertise you know, from processing. Lawrence Meats likes to uh, produce it. You have to have the capital. And of course, you have to have the market. And we've talked a lot about market here that there's a lot of people interested in uh, grass-fed beef right now. The, the thing that I can't stress enough is that even though they're interested in it, doesn't mean they'll buy it unless it's extremely easy for them to get to. You know, because Americans are notorious about saying one thing and doing another. So it's critical that you get the right size when you're thinking, because you know, if you're going to go too big, if you pick too big, too high of aspiration, like, like we did at Lawrence Meats the first year out, you're almost guaranteed to fail. And odds are you're going to run out of cash. It's like the majority of small businesses in the United States fail because they ran out of cash. Not because that was a bad idea, not because the market didn't want their product, because they just didn't have enough money. So too big is almost guaranteed to fail because odds are you're going to run out of money before you get up on plane. And if it's too small, it's not sustainable. But again, that's with the caveat that um, success is self-defined. So if it's only two beef a year and that's all you want and you're happy with that, you know, that, that's not too small, but that is a hobby. That's not a career. But you can still be OK with that. So the, the too small only really relates to if you really want to try to make it a career. So when we talk about, you know, if once we get this idea of who we are and where we want to go and, and where we are right now, we got to start picking a team so we can really make commitments to people. And the t your team is going to be your production, your processing, your sales and distribution. You know, they're just basic good business questions about how they're going to help you, how they're going to partner with you. It's really important when you get to the meat processor, that that's my expertise, is the number one thing in, in a meat processor is do you trust them? Now, we knew we were in a trust-based business, so when we built our business, we put an observation room in it. So when you come to Cannon Falls, you are all welcome to stop by. You don't need an appointment. I may or may not be there, but there are people that are there that can give you a tour. And the tour will consist of you walking up into our observation room, and you can see our kill floor, and you can see our cutting room. Michael Poland mentioned us in the Omnivore's Dilemma, and he referred to us as the glass arbitoire. Well, we got like a two by three window. I don't, it's not a very big window. So a glass arbitoir is a little bit of a, a creative stretch. But you can see everything we do in our kill floor. And, and you can see everything we do in the cutting room. And the things you can't see from those windows, we've got closed circuit televisions um, that you can see the rest of the plant. Uh, because we're in a trust-based business, because we need our farmers to trust us, we feel transparency is, is so critical. So you, know, you want to stop by and watch? Come by and watch. We have nothing to hide. We, we are proud of what we do, and we're proud of the people that we have worked for us. So make sure you can trust them. I had a direct marketer one time that, um, that had this customer called me and was so mad because we stole some meat from her. And, and, and you know, it's just like, uh, you know, I, I often ask groups of farmers how many people have had processors steal meat from them. And, and it's like, oh, well, everybody raises their hands. And then when I talk to pr uh, processors, I have, you know, how many times has a farmer screwed you over? And every, every processor raises their, their hand. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's like we're all, you know, we have to work together. We've got to get past this pettiness. But so anyway, we, this lady called, and her customer called me, and, and we had stolen some meat from her. And I talked through the issue. And I, uh, 
And I said to the customer, well, did you call the farmer? And say, oh yeah, I called her. And I said, well, what did she say relative to what yield she thought you should have got? And, and she said, well, she kind of thinks you steal from her once in a while, but you do such a good job in packaging, she just lets it go. <laughs> so, so I called the lady and I asked her to never come back, you know, as a farmer. If you don't trust me, don't come here. You know, it just, I, it's, I can't prove that we did it right, so you have to trust me, and I'm doing everything we can to show you that we're doing it right. Um, so you have to have a, a processor you can trust. Another big uh, dilemma with meat processors is will they grow with you? You know, and it's like I told you earlier that we had to grow. We had to go out and seek capital so we could grow because it's so expensive. Most guys that they got their thing and they got their building paid for and you know they're sitting pretty good and and you're challenging them to put a whole bunch of money back into the business and um, and um, and they're not ready to do it. So. Um, you know, it gets to be a real challenge if, if they're committed to growing with you. And then the last thing is, will their packaging satisfy your customer? So, um, you know, the whole packaging thing is, the whole packaging thing is, um, is, is so wide open because I, I know of direct marketers that are perfectly happy with paper wrap packages. It works fine for them. So that's fine. But I have... I personally work with a lot of branded programs that have to have some very top shelf packaging. So the question is, is you, you don't have to have a processor that has, that has the most expensive um, packaging equipment. You have to have the processor that has the packaging equipment that satisfies your customer's needs. And at the end of the day, if you branded your beliefs, if you got them to buy into the farm, if you're only selling 10 head, if you only have 40 customers to manage, Really, how much does it matter? You know, you have so much more flexibility because you can tell them that I chose this processor because I like paper wrap packaging. And you're their farmer, so um, you know. So it, you've got a lot, of, a lot of flexibility on what that packaging should be. So here's the, here's the five questions that we have uh, for meat processors. And it's what kind of certifications do you have? You know, are you... Are you custom exempt, or are you state inspected, or are you federal inspected? Uh, believe it or not, there's processors that are running processing businesses that don't even understand it themselves. You know, so you don't have to take a test to get a meat plant. You know, it's like um, we all. You, I'm sure you guys all know farmers that aren't qualified to be farmers, but still somehow miraculously hang on. Believe it or not, there's processors that aren't qualified to be processors that still miraculously know how to hang on. So. Um, they have to be able to articulate that. You know, who have you worked with? Um, what challenges do you foresee? Um, uh, are there any special services and are you able to grow? You know, that's basically the five questions you're gonna ask a meat processor before you, um, uh, before you understand if they're willing, if they're worth committing to. You know, that's what it boils down to. It, you know, I, I, I wanna make sure that you hear this caveat. I, if you want to grow your direct marketing, you have to commit to a processor. Don't commit to a bum. You know, don't commit to a crook. You know, pick the right guy. If you have to drive to the end of the world and, you, and they meet your criteria, then you can, can commit to them and you can build a program and you can trust that you can build your program because you know they'll do what they said and you do what you said. So what are commitments and examples? So, you know, we talk about commitments, and I'm not talking about signing contracts or anything fancy. I'm just talking about doing this as simple as say what you're going to do and do what you say. If you say you're going to bring five head, bring five head. I don't care. I don't want to hear the excuse about the trailer with the flat tire or it didn't get rained this night or whatever. You said five head, bring five head. That's how you build trust. Hold your, hold your processor to the same standard. If they said it would be done on Friday, it should be done on Friday. Don't need excuses, because you made commitments. And, and hold each other to your commitments. And, and don't immediately go to um, arguing about it. Just remind people that these are the commitments you made and stay with them. Document understandings. I love emails because it's a good it's a good track of you said you would do this and I said I would do that. Simple documents, not contracts. Guaranteed volumes, you know. 
pledge to a processor that you're going to bring a certain number of, of head. You know, the number one issue I hear about small direct marketers working with small local plants is come fall, they won't let me in because of deer season. Well, have you ever tried guaranteeing and say, I'm going to, I absolutely promise I'll bring 20, on the, 20 in this month and I'll pay for them in advance because I'm going to be there. But you can't kick me out for deer. You know, try to do things that show your commitment to them. Don't wait until the end of October and then be mad that they didn't have a slot for you in November when it's deer season. Think of all your stakeholders as partners. Well, Todd so graciously um, said that he always uh, felt that Lawrence Meats was a partner of theirs. I clearly feel that Thousand Hills is a partner of mine. Uh, I take it very personally. Um, their successes and failures, I take great pride in their successes. I take great uh, sadness in their failures. I, I, um, um, they are a key partner of ours. So is High Plains Bison. So is Organic Meat Company. Um, you know, all these companies we work with are, are truly partners of mine. Anticipate your partner's needs. The way Lawrence Meats demonstrates that is we go out for certifications, we try to gain capacities, we try to improve reporting so our customers have better information so they can make money because if they don't make money, they don't pay us, you know. And then the last thing is listen to each other. You know, that's a great, that's a great form of commitment if you sit down and listen to each other and try to get to resolutions. So that's my presentation. Yeah.